Co-Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about neoadjuvant treatment in rectal cancer today. So I have no disclosures. Um, in the available time, I've divided my talk into four parts. Uh, briefly, uh, looking at the standard of care. Secondly, the intensification of the concurrent chemoradiotherapy approach. Touching on the addition of neoadjuvant chemotherapy to standard of care and also the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy instead of uh, chemoradiation. Clearly, this is a, a changing field in a positive way. Uh, there are a lot of controversies, and I can't cover all of uh, the detail in the available time. But in terms of the standard of care, I've picked on two uh, guidelines, the NICE guidelines and the ESMO guidelines published in the last uh, couple of years, both reflecting and quite similar uh, in terms of their approach of identifying risk stratification for patients selected for preoperative radiotherapy or chemoradiation. Other guidelines are less selective, but these two guidelines are trying to identify low-risk patients, medium-risk, and high-risk patients. So they're very similar in their recommendations. Uh, importantly, early tumors are recommended to avoid uh, radiotherapy or chemoradiation prior to resection. It's very important that we think about this because there is a significant element of overtreatment in patients having resection of early stage tumors. And I think that reflects high quality staging. Uh, and Gina's uh, illustrated the importance of radiology and MR in that. As far as intermediate risk cancers are concerned, both short course and chemoradiation are recommended. There's wide variation around the world, and both of these approaches have been compared in two phase three trials. Uh, the results seem fairly similar, and uh, I'm not going to enter into the debate as to which of those should be chosen. As far as more advanced tumors, then chemoradiation is the standard of care. So regarding neoadjuvant therapy, we should avoid uh, radiotherapy in good prognostic patients. Uh, five by five for intermediate risk is an acceptable option and can be used with a delay to surgery in patients who are considered frail and unfit for chemoradiotherapy in the advanced group. As far as the high-risk patients are concerned, clearly chemoradiation is the standard of care. Uh, fluoroprimidines most commonly use 5-FU and capecitabine. The radiotherapy dose varies a little bit, uh, and that can be applied to both intermediate and high-risk patients. However, uh, I think we would agree that we have a bigger problem, and the bigger problem is illustrated here from the long-term follow-up of the German trial. There's plenty of pieces of evidence I could choose to illustrate this fact. Uh, in the middle panel, you can see the incidence of distant metastases from the long-term follow-up of this study of preoperative versus postoperative chemoradiation, and that rate is around 30%. The recent uh, analysis uh, of the Proctor Scripps and Chronicle trials showed that was around 25%. However, local recurrences is now well below 10% with preoperative chemoradiation. So distant metastases is the bigger problem. So what about the approaches? So intensification of concurrent chemoradiotherapy. In the time available, I'm just going to focus on some phase three trial data. Uh, in summary, uh, targeted uh, therapies remain the subject of uh, phase two treatments and have been disappointing to date. Uh, and I'm just going to look at some of the phase three oxaliplatin data. So there are five phase three trials that have reported. Not all have been uh, reported in terms of their long-term cancer outcomes in peer review publications. That's restricted to the ACCORD 12 trial. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of data from the German AIO 04 trial. Um, they have slightly different strategies, which I'll briefly allude to. Uh, there's differences in radiotherapy dose. For example, in the ACCORD-12 trial, the actual radiotherapy dose was higher in the experimental arm with oxaliplatin compared with the capecitabine control arm of 45 gray. There are different approaches where certain of these trials have used addition of oxaliplatin to both the concurrent and the adjuvant component, and others have just focused on the concurrent components only. The STAR trial will report data hopefully next year. Uh, that's an event-driven uh, analysis. The PETAC-6 study is uh, being analyzed at the moment with a view to publication. However, I'm very grateful to Klaus Riddell for sharing some data which I'm going to show to you from the AIO-04 study. 
This is in press with the Lancet Oncology and is due to be published in the next uh, few weeks. This has been presented at ASCO. Uh, the results of this study uh, show a very high R0 resection rate with no difference between the treatment arms. Uh, a difference in local recurrence, but it's important to note that at three years, these local recurrence rates are very low. We'll have to follow over time what those re uh, reflect at the five-year point, but the difference between those two arms is really very small. There's a 4% difference in the distant metastasis rate, and putting that together in terms of disease-related events, there is a small but significant improvement in disease-free survival, but not overall survival. When one looks at the toxicity, interruptions of radiotherapy, and radiotherapy and chemotherapy compliance, these are summarized on this slide. It's important to note that this study had phase two data, non-randomized data before, which included a gap uh, in the middle week of the chemo radiotherapy, which may in part explain the relatively small increases of the toxicity and the good radiotherapy compliance that's seen uh, in the experimental arm with oxaliplatin. If we put together the um, pathological complete response rates from the five trials, not all of these are peer-reviewed publications. The only ones reflecting that are the AIO and the Accord 12. The others are in uh, abstract form. You can see that there is a trend, but uh, the, the difference in path CR rate is quite small. Um, there was no difference whatsoever seen in the STAR trial. There's one other trial um, ongoing in the UK, which is taking a different approach, which is looking at the addition of arinotecan to capecitabine radiotherapy. This study has recruited approximately 330 patients so far. Uh, this is uh, different in some ways, one of which is MRI-mandated high-risk patients entering into this study. So in terms of the intensification studies with chemoradiotherapy, there's no change in standard of care at this stage. We are awaiting phase three published outcome data from the majority of these trials, and actually looking through them in a lot of detail is really important to actually try and ident identify what the true benefit is in the long term and what the subsets are that are more likely to benefit. Many of the trials suffer from the limitation of not having high quality pelvic M MR uh, at the time of staging, and there are some difficulties in interpreting the data. The platforms uh, may uh, differ uh, in terms of the German AIO trial, for example. The 5FU schedule in the control arm and the experimental arm is different, and that's recognized as a limitation by the authors. Radiotherapy dose can differ, as I've said in the ACCORD study. The trial designs are mixed, with some actually using the oxaliplatin both adjuvantly and concurrently, and others just focusing on the chemoradiation question. I think case mix is a particular issue in, in interpreting these studies, as there are likely to be a lot of intermediate risk patients in, this, uh, in these studies. Um, and we need to look at the uh, toxicity and radiotherapy compliance of the experimental schedules. So moving on to the addition of neoadjuvant chemotherapy to the standard of care, um, there are clear uh, reasons why neoadjuvant chemotherapy would be advantageous. It allows full dose systemic chemotherapy to be given earlier. It can be associated with reduced toxicity and better compliance, and I'll show you a small amount of data for that. Um, not commonly recognized, but clearly very important for the patient, is an earlier reversal of a defunctioning stoma is very likely if your new adjuvant therapy can at least in part or in total be given up front. And it also potentially provides a platform for future biomarker and novel therapies. Uh, and David Cunningham will be talking about targeted therapies uh, in rectal cancer later. As far as disadvantages, I, I think one of the key issues is around the, the appropriate selection of patients and the risk of overtreatment. The delays to curative surgery seem to be uh, not seen in the phase two data, but we do need good phase three trial evidence. So the neoadjuvant approach has in part been used through the expert trials, through expert and expert C. I'm grateful to David Cunningham's group for these slides. Um, so this PANEX experience was presented at ASCO in 2014 with the neoadjuvant approach and a post-operative approach as well. And when one looks at the uh, partial and complete response rates with the combined data, we're seeing a complete response rate of 4%, partial response of 
and the pathological complete response of 18%. And those data are very encouraging, as are the local progression-free survival shown on the left and the distant uh, progression-free survival shown on the right. So the Fernandez Martos uh, group published in 2010 in JCO uh, data about the sequence of chemotherapy. So this is a randomized phase two, small study of just over 100 patients where the randomization was between giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to chemoradiation or chemoradiation followed by surgery and postoperative adjuvant chemotherapy. You can see the pathological complete response rates were similar as were the R0 resection rates. But as I mentioned earlier, the advantage of new adjuvant chemotherapy is the significant reduction in grade three, four toxicity during the neoadjuvant compared with post-op adjuvant. The radiotherapy compliance was, was high and similar between the two arms. The long-term follow-up of this study has been recently e-published in Annals of Oncology. It shows very low rates of local recurrence with the two arms but it still shows that the distant metastasis rate remains a problem uh, with the distant metastasis rate just over 20%. Uh, clearly in a study of this size of only 100 patients, it would be hard to see a clear signal in favor of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but there are, there are no signs of a deleterious outcome from that approach. So as uh, Cornelis van der Velde has mentioned, the Rapido trial is a, a success, uh, success story. This is taking uh, some of the uh, high-risk intermediate uh, and the high-risk rectal cancers and comparing chemo radiation with 5x5 five five radiation followed by capecitabine oxaliplatin. In some countries, post-operatively in the control arm, capecitabine oxaliplatin has been given and in some countries that is not being used, which may have some limitation depending on Hans's uh, uh, interpretation of the post-operative adjuvant data, which we'll hear in a minute. This study has recruited 650 patients and is doing very well and will be very influential uh, in telling us a, a bit about the addition of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. There's a proposed study between the UK uh, with uh, detailed discussions going on between Australia and Sweden. This is taking an approach of uh, high risk features seen on the MR, which is extramural spread, node positivity or extramural vascular invasion and the MDT determining the pelvic strategy, whether that's surgery or whether it's chemo radiation and surgery or short course radiotherapy and surgery. And the question is the sequencing of post-operative adjuvant chemotherapy or neoadjuvant chemotherapy and patients would be stratified according to the pelvic strategy. That's not a funded study, that's in under discussion. So finally, what, when can we uh, consider using neoadjuvant chemotherapy instead of chemo radiation. So there are a number of small non-randomized phase two studies that have uh, reported encouraging outcomes with high R0 uh, response, uh, uh, resection rates with impressive uh, pathological complete response rates in general. Um, but clearly these studies are exploratory and we need uh, further evidence. So the PROSPECT trial being run in the United States is looking at patients with effectively stage two and stage three rectal cancer who are randomized to chemo radiation followed by TME and adjuvant chemotherapy or upfront Folfox restaged. And those who've actually had uh, a good response go on to surgery without their irradiation. Only those who actually have a very poor response have salvaged chemo radiation uh, in, in this schema. It has an embedded phase two safety aspect which is around 350 patients looking at R0 resection rates and the co-primary endpoints at phase three are time to local recurrence and disease-free survival. So the final bit of data that I'm gonna show you, uh, and I'm grateful to Julio Garcia Aguilar for sharing this data. Uh, this is a series of sequential studies looking at increasing use of Folfox therapy after chemo radiation prior to surgery in the preoperative setting this data is impressed with Lancet Oncology and will appear in the next few weeks as well. Uh, the initial group, initial cohort of 60 patients were treated with chemo radiation. The second with two cycles of Folfox, the third with four cycles, and then the fourth with six cycles. So each cohort is around 60 patients. This is an exploratory 
uh, approach. You can see that from the patient characteristics, the majority of patients are stage three, but around a quarter are stage two. Uh, and the majority of these patients are staged with transrectal ultrasound. The use of MR is around no more than a quarter of the patients. The data in terms of pathological complete response from these four, four cohorts are shown on this slide. Uh, so that the increasing use of the extra schedule of uh, the cycles of Folfox uh, are increasing with each of these four cohorts. So in conclusion, uh, there is no change in standard of care on the basis of the current evidence. I think although we're interested in intensifying therapy, we should be very cognizant of the fact that we rely on high quality staging, high quality techniques and appropriate selection of patients. We do need to be aware that with high quality surgery, we can significantly overtreat patients and we need to be wary of that. However, the neoadjuvant chemotherapy approaches in the phase two data is uh, very promising, uh, but clearly we need phase three trial data to inform major changes in clinical practice, both the value of adding neoadjuvant chemotherapy to standard of care and the more contentious but in also interesting question of whether neoadjuvant chemotherapy is as good as neoadjuvant chemoradiation. Uh, and I thank you for your attention.